Hello everybody, thank you for joining us for the second student thematic session on pasture and agronomy, agronomy systems. Um, we have a special guest today, Dr. Jacobo Arango from SEAT, to speak to us about, um, to help us discuss your research and direct your research questions. So I'll let him introduce himself in a moment, but first of all, we'll just go through some housekeeping. You've each done a slide before, a, a session with us, the student session before. Sorry, it's really early in the morning, so I'm a little bit tired. Um, so you know the drill. So you know that you can use the chat box to record questions as we have the students present. We've got five students doing presentations today from all over the world and yeah we do encourage you to please record your questions as they're speaking and then um, we can actually this is a meeting so you can actually voice your questions at the end of each presentation so we'll have about five minutes for questions at the end of each student presentation and then at the end of the session we'll have about 30 minutes for discussion a group discussion where it would be great to hear from um, some of your supervisors from the host institutes and also from your home institutes, as well as um, all of the other students from the other rounds. So myself will be facilitating this session um, with Dr. Hakobo Arango. So without further ado, if you are able to share your screen, Hakobo, that would be excellent. Okay. Can you hear me well? Hello, yes. my name is Vanina Maguire. I'm Argentinian. I've been doing my research today. Mm. Mm. Okay. Let me stop sharing. <coughs> Here we go. Were you able to share your screen, Apollo? Yes, I'm on it. Yes, wait, I was, yes. Yeah, so can you see it now? Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent. So yes, it's a pleasure for me to be with you guys uh, today. It's uh, really fascinating to uh, share in a moment with people in so many parts of the globe but all with the same, with a common interest. So as Hasele was uh, telling you, uh, my name is Jacobo Arango. So I am a senior scientist at the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT. I am located in Cali, Colombia, in the headquarters of the Alliance for the Americas. So I am really keen to, to hear uh, I think uh, a few students, maybe four students today, sharing with us what are they research and what, what's their plan uh, to develop under the Cliff uh, Grad SICAFS uh, uh, program. Uh, I have only had a good experience with this program. And uh, as a, uh, to start this session, I would like to share some of our research in terms of uh, using tropical forages uh, to, to mitigate, as a tool to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and combat climate change. So the ambition is very high. Uh, so first some introduction. So I think we should be all in the same uh, page, uh, believing that livestock production is an important part of, uh, of human development. So here are just some numbers that I'm going to uh, skip uh, fairly fast because I think, uh, but this gives us some justification of why we work with livestock. So there is a huge numbers of livestock units already in the globe. So about two thirds of the agricultural land is occupied by livestock systems. So this, the, the, the market value of the livestock uh, systems is very, very high and also account for a large number of, uh, of, of jobs or employment. 
uh, and then we start to see some negative uh, uh, values or that we would like to revert. So for example, only in Latin America, there are estimated to, to be more uh, 200 uh, million hectares in, uh, in a, some degree of degradation. And then what we all know, uh, livestock is also responsible for a big chunk of the greenhouse gas emitted. Uh, uh, so we need to do something for, uh, around that. So as a conclusion, I think raised livestock systems are the world's uh, single, single best land use and, the, and a big source of greenhouse gas emissions. So can improve uh, forages uh, make a difference? This is like our research questions in, in, the, in SEAT. So in SEAT, we, do, we have um, two approaches. One is um, to develop new forage materials to breeding. And the second one is through germ plus uh, selection. So for that, we have a, a, a genetic resource unit or a gene bank where uh, thousands of materials of uh, forage materials have been collected and are stored, but uh, not stored for the purpose of storing and preserving, but not only that, but uh, for the use so that uh, scientists and farmers can use. So our goal is to develop improved pastures uh, that are resistant to extreme conditions and that farmers can use. And we uh, hope that they can contribute to increase animal and crop productivity while reducing the environmental impacts. So we work a lot in, uh, around the concept of sustainable intensification, as you can see here in, the, in this graphic. Uh, so to be able to have more livestock units uh, per, per unit of area so that uh, uh, some uh, land can be spared for more sustainable purposes or for, for forest, for example. And, and also we aim to have a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Mm. So as an example, I will show you a, a trial that we have here on SEAT campus. That is a six hectare trial where we combine different uh, type of forages that have been developed in SEAT. So I will take uh, only three of the, of the six treatments, the last uh, three. So we have uh, the first treatment that is an only grass, as you can see here in the image, that is Brachiaria hybrid uh, cultivar caiman. This is one of the newest hybrids of, of SEAT. Uh, then we combine this hybrid with um, a herbaceous legume that is called Canavalia brasiliensis. And in the third treatment, we have the, the improved grass, the herbaceous legume, plus a shrub legume that is called Leucena diversifolia in the so-called silvopastoral system, as you can see here in the graphic with the, with the shrubs. So the idea of this trial was to demonstrate the uh, potential eco-efficiency of improved forage-based silvopastoral system. So the first thing is that we were able to, to uh, uh, have more animals per unit of area, uh, three to four animals per hectare, versus the national average that is below one animal per hectare. And then we also measured the live weight gain of these animals that were uh, subjected to each individual treatment. So realizing that uh, 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 when you increment the uh, forage options in the diet, then you also have a almost a linear response in terms of live weight gain. And this is what you want. This is, these are just a back of the envelope calculation with a national average of 200 grams per animal per day. Probably you will need uh, more than 1,000 days to have this animal to the slaughter age. But uh, uh, with the, our best treatment, we were able to reduce this uh, uh, time to uh, uh, almost a third, to 350 days. And that, of course, represents an emission reduction because you have the animal for less time they're producing enteric methane. Then we make also some calculation of the projection of the area needed to produce a, a very good production that is 800 kilograms of live weight gain uh, per year. So what, what is the area that you need? So if you have a native pasture, you will need probably 10 uh, hectares. 
These calculations are based on the actual stocking rate that I showed you before, and also the lightweight gains of, of, the, of the trial. Then if you have a, an introduced a slightly better pasture, you will immediately reduce that to a third. Um, if you have an improved for a pasture, you will need only 1.7 hectares. And if you have the, the, the tropical grass caiman plus the herbaceous legume, you will be close to one hectare. And if you have the full silvopastoral system with two different type of legumes and the improved uh, pasture, you will need less than one hectare to produce the same amount of meat. So this is like a, a good demonstration of what we call sustainable intensification. And, and also the IPCC recognized this as a, a, a very good option in the sustainable intensification to reduce the footprint, carbon footprint of animal uh, production. This will of course be traduced in in reducing pressure to the forest that is, as we all know, a big carbon reserve. Um, then I, uh, I would like to move now to what we are doing in terms of uh, trying to mitigate the enteric ethane, methane emissions. So as you are all know, and probably even better than me, so uh, methane is produced by enteric fermentation uh, in, in, the, in the rumen of, of ruminants. Uh, so this is uh, starting with a fascinating process that the ruminants have to extract actually energy from uh, fiber uh, uh, that all animals that for example mammals we are not able to or not mammals but humans uh, better to say we are not able to to extract this uh, this energy or these uh, nutrients uh, as, a, as byproduct of this enteric methane fermentation, uh, uh, methane gas is produced uh, with uh, free molecules of hydrogen and carbon that are uh, produced, uh, and then methane is emitted as byproduct. So we have been testing with different students uh, uh, how can uh, shifting diets, testing different diets based on improved forages can uh, do to uh, reduce uh, methane emissions. And this is the case of Leucena. So this is the paper of Denise uh, Montoya Flores, where she uh, uh, evaluated uh, the uh, methane emissions of a group of animals with uh, different amounts of uh, Leucena leaves uh, that contain different amounts of uh, condensed tannins and she measured, uh, she found like a very good relation uh, when she uh, added more uh, tannin, uh, the dosage was higher. She found that the methane emissions was effectively reduced. She, she showed a very nice dosage effect. So uh, Xiomara Gaviria also uh, showed that grazing management is key uh, to reduce enteric methane emissions and to improve uh, efficiency. So using the same uh, grass, that is the same caiman grass, at two different uh, regrowth stages, one that is close to the optimal uh, uh, grazing uh, time for the for the pasture, that uh, was 45 days, and, and one uh, uh, the same pasture but uh, with a longer time of regrowth, she measured the Methane emission, realizing that when you, uh, when actually the animals have access or or are uh, consume the better uh, pasture in terms of regrowth, you have less uh, methane emission. So, uh, management is also critical. In ma grazing management is also critical. Now I would like to move now to emissions from soil. So since about more than 20 years, I think. Uh, SIAT and colleagues in Japan, we have been working in a concept that is called biological nitrification inhibition. And this is um, the process where uh, some grasses produce uh, chemical roots, chemical compounds, sorry, from the roots and they exudate to the soil. And these compounds, they interfere with the microbial uh, nitrogen process in the soil uh, slowing the pace of, trans, of uh, transforming um, um, uh, ammonium to nitrate and therefore 
uh, nitrous oxide emission is reduced. So what we did, what, what we showed first uh, was to simulate in urine events. So we collected uh, urine in buckets and placed it in specific uh, locations. And we tested two different grasses. One that is called mulatto, that ha doesn't have this, this capacity or it's very low. And then uh, 679 that we realized that it has a high BNI capacity. So producing a lot of these molecules and therefore reducing the pace of nitrification. And we realize, as you can see here in the, in the graph of nitrous oxide fluxes, that this grass was able to effectively reduce the nitrous oxide emissions from the soil. Then we ask ourselves whether this uh, phenomenon was present only in the Brachiaria uh, genus. And then we evaluate the full uh, uh, panicum uh, 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 population in Sia, that is the founder population for, for, for plant breeding, for, for uh, panicum breeding, panicum or megatirsus, not what it's called now. And we realized we were able to identify at least three groups in the whole range of accessions. Ones that were with low BNI that were not able to effectively reduce nitrous oxide emissions. One in uh, some, some others in the middle, maybe the majority that uh, reduced the, the, the nitrous oxide emissions, but not to the full extent as the high BNI uh, uh, pastures that were located here that were effectively reducing the, the uh, oxidation of ammonium to nitrate, and therefore they were able to reduce uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Uh, some concluding remarks be before giving the floor to what's uh, more important for us is that listening to the students and maybe providing some feedback. So although livestock is an important source of income uh, uh, for farmers, it is also a significant source of greenhouse gas emissions. So I think we cannot deny that. Uh, we can say that well-managed tropical forages can help to intensify production in less area. And the inclusion of forage legumes that are rich in some secondary metabolites like tannins and, and saponins can improve productivity and at the same time reduce methane emissions. And some improved grasses, I show you the cases of Brachiaria and Panicum or Urocloa and Megatirsus are, as they are known now, exhibit BNI abilities that increase the nitrogen use efficiency from the grass and reduce nitrous oxide emissions. I hope I didn't take too much time from you and uh, now I give the floor to the students. I'm very keen to know more about their research. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacobo. That was excellent. A really, really good overview of pasture and agronomy systems. Um, I will hand over the floor to Vanina Maguire now, who is from Argentina, and she will be studying at in Spain on her Cliff Grads research stay soon. And her PhD is adding value to rumen methane mitigation compounds through increasing animal efficiency. So, Vani, if you would like to share your screen, the floor. Yes. Uh -huh. There, can you see it? Um, my presentation? Not just yet, but sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah. It says that my sharing screen is disabled. You can try now. I don't know if you can see my presentation now. Mm. 
Not just yet. I think. Is it, is I it can. Now? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, well, it, can you see it, everybody? Yeah, if you can expand it out, that would be good. Like that? Yes, exactly. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Vanina Maguire. I'm doing my research today at Sede Nutrición Animal, Estación Experimental de Sairin, depending on CSIC in Spain, under the supervision of Alejandro Belanche and David Janis Ruiz. I participated and I collaborated to the project called Adding Value to Methane, to Rumen Methane Emission uh, Mitigation Compounds through Increasing Animal Efficiency. So, our research objectives were to assess the effects of lotus species as a forage diet in the ruminant nitrogen metabolism and feed efficiency through the analysis of different fermentation parameters, including enteric methane production as a strategy for reducing greenhouse gases emissions from livestock production. I have to say that lotus species is a perennial legume naturalized in the Salado River Basin a beef cattle region of Argentina is the most important beef cattle region, where due to edaphic constraints such as water logging periods and saline, sodic and saline soils, the production depends mainly on naturalized or implanted pastures that can stand those conditions. So in these environments, lotus species arises as a high quality forage legume for, uh, for these environments. Okay. Um, we performed our experiments and for the experimental design we, we use a set of legume species and non-legume species such as lolium. So the species were lotus tenuis, lotus corniculatus and the hybrid between lotus tenuis by lotus corniculatus and um, lucerne medicaus sativa. These legume species in combination with the non-legume species like lolium uh, in different participation levels. For example, um, here you have the inclusion levels. The first one means that uh, you have zero legume and 100% of lolium and so on, and 15% of legume and 85% of, of regrass. Those were the inclusion levels of the legume. And then we tested for two vegetative stages only for lotus species. We have vegetative and flowering. So uh, we performed three experiments where the, uh, two, the, two, um, uh, the first and the second were, were non-renovated experiments. And the first, we went an in vitro fermentation where we tested for a set of fermentation parameters, including methane production. Um, it lasted 24 hours. The second one was the same, the same design as the first one, but uh, the difference is that it lasted 96 hours and we measured the gas pressure at 2, 4, 7, 12, 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours. We also measured methane emission in the second analysis. And the third one was to, to, uh, to analyze the ruminal degradation and duodenal digestibility of the different diets. And um, for the different diets, we assessed for chemical composition, including the concentration of condensed tannins and methane production in the first and second one. Um, and a third analysis that is still being doing, that is uh, the analysis of rumen microbiota. So, without going into extensive details, I want to say that uh, the methodology we used for um, methane quantification was first we we measure the gas pressure of each bottle of fermentation using a pressure analyzer and digital. 
And then we collected methane in vacuum containers, five milliliters. So then we calculated the volume of each bottle using the um, general gas law. And the percent percentage of methane was related to that volume of, of gas. Methane quantification was done by gas chromatography. And apart from that, we tested for a nitrogen quantification using an elementary analyzer. So we tested for ammonium and, and methane through the different diets and other parameter, fermentation parameters. So we have, for now, preliminary results because we are still analyzing our data. And for example, I can say that we, we saw that Lotus corniculatus show the highest levels of condensed tannins at both phenological stages. In average, we have in, in the vegetative stage, 3.15% of the dried matter. And in flowering, we have 4.6%. So it's higher in the flowering stage. Besides Lotus tenuis and the hybrid between them, Lotus tenuis by Lotus corniculatus, show similar values between them and, but lower than Lotus corniculatus. Then regarding methane production at 24 hours, this uh, methane production varied according to the inclusion level and the phenological stage. We, um, we didn't see any differences among lewin species. Then total methane production, I mean uh, the methane measured at six and 24 hours, varied according to the phenological stage, being flowering the stage with the lowest values. We think these differences um, depend on the levels of condensed tanning. We are analyzing that. Apart from that, the rates of gas production varied according to the Lewin species, the inclusion level and the phenological stage. So this parameter varied among the three factor, uh, factors we, we incorporated in, the, in our analysis. So preliminary conclusions also is that the use of condensed tanning containing lotus species as a forage legume in pastures is a good strategy to contribute to the reduction of methane emissions from livestock productions. And that uh, lotus species maintain nutritional quality even at advanced phenological stages, allowing a long utilization period. So that's all. I would like to, to thank David and Alejandro and their working team for the very kind hostage I received in Spain. Thank you very much. Great, uh, thank you, Vani, that's excellent. Thank you. Are there any questions for Vani? And I believe Huckleball, you can see the, the chat box as well, which is where some of the questions will come through. But anyone is welcome to raise your hand and ask a question. I can see the... I can start off with a question for you, Vani, and then perhaps, oh, sorry, we have a, a question by Ahmed. So I'll just ask you to unmute Ahmed and then you can go first. I can see the screen. Hello? Hello. Yeah, well done, um, Magua, for the good job. Thank you very much. Yeah, I want to ask, like, uh, for example, the tannin that is present in the species that you use, are there other plants that have been identified having the same, that same condensed tannin that can be used for reduction in methane in animal feed? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question? Okay. The species you use to feed, yes. it contains the active ingredient that is um, leading to reduction in methane production is tannin, condensed tannin. Yes. Okay. Is there any other species that you have identified that can be used, especially in tropical area, that can serve the same effect, that also contains tannin as active ingredient? For example, I, um, we saw that Lotus corniculatus was the species that contained the most high, high levels of condensed tannin among the species we used. But I, it's not a tropical legume, it's a temperate legume. I think you asked that. And uh, Lotus corniculatus has more, an average of 4 and 5% of condensed tannins. All right, thank you. I don't know I if the, that was your question. Yes, I'm thinking of, you know, I'm calling from Nigeria. I'm thinking of a situation where we can have the same type of species in a tropical um, situation like Nigeria, where we can run a trial and we'll give similar results of reduction in methane through um, that uh, species, through a similar species. Yes, Lotus corniculatus is not a tropical legume, it's a temperate legume, but uh, I know that the Lotus corniculatus can stand a wide range of environmental conditions, also tropical conditions. So um, it would be a good strategy for reducing methane emissions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I see that there is a question from Susan as well. Um, if you're able to unmute Susan, you can ask your question. I, I come from Kenya and uh, yeah. I'm working on Bracaria grasses. I know of uh, sorghum. Sorghum has tannins. And, yes. uh, but most of the times uh, our, our farmers are afraid to use sorghum because they Probably they use it when they have not let it wilt a bit because it causes some other effects on livestock. So I think sorghum could also, if, if we could uh, turn it to the tropical areas in Africa or Kenya, maybe we could try sorghum for that. Then, the other, uh, then now I have a question. You talked about um, uh, the, 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 green, the greenhouse gases emissions. Uh, yes. become less when when you feed at flowering i'm working yes. on i'm working on uh, on feeding hay hay bracaria hays and um, there's eragrostis superba this side of kenya um, uh, i'm asking so does it mean that with uh, advancement of age as they plants grow maturer then uh, maybe greenhouse gases will be less because flowering is towards uh, maturity and then as they as they dry, as they become hay, the greenhouse gases may be less. Could, could that be the case? In the case of Lotus corniculatus and Lotus tenuis, I mean Lotus species, the fact that in flowering they have more, a more concentration of condensed tannins, yes, it's due to the, to the phenological stage, to the maturity of the pasture. But for example, Lotus tenuis, concentrates their uh, condensed tannins in the flower. So in the flowering stage, lotus tannins will, will be this, the same, similar to lotus corniculatus. So um, um, being fresh forages or dried forages in this case is the same because they don't, they don't get rid of the, of, of the tannins despite the phenological stage. So um, yes, in in flowering in the flowering stage, we have the like the benefits of condensed tannins regarding methane emissions. We don't have those benefits in when, when the animal is feeding lotus tenuis species. But when lotus tenuis is is in flowering stage, yes, you have the the benefits. I mean of condensed tannins also happens with lotus corniculatus. 
um, in, in every, every case, our levels of condensanins are higher in, um, in the flowering stage, but we don't lose quality. Great, thank you, Vani. I think we have another question by Sani. If um, Sani, you would like to unmute and ask your question. Are you there, Sani? We have some other questions, Vani. Hello. 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 Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you. And, uh, I just want to know, yeah, I just want to know the, you know, the situation of this your research on I understand you tell us at what stage the sound is very bad I can't uh, understand the question uh, I and can't hear if you Sunny, if you pop your question in the chat box, I can ask it for you. Um, so we have, Sunny, a question from Titus from Indonesia, who we heard from in the welcome presentation. She had asked um, what the ruminal fluid was that you used, whether it be the cattle or some other ruminant. Let me, let me uh, come me. Alejandro has uh, responded to that, saying that the rumen fluid was from sheep. Uh, she also asked what the diet composition was and do you follow the research um, do you follow up with the research for your in vivo experiment um, so yeah Alejandro has commented that the diet composition was 100% forage and also that lotus ryegrass and lotus in different concentrations I'm not sure if you have any additional comments to add Sorry, here I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yes, we use ruminal liquid from from cows, from cattle, from this latter because we it was the only option we had at the quarantine time. And uh, what was the other question? The inclusion levels of the legume and the and the and the non legume species. A different diet composition and also um, following up the research in in vivo experiment. No, in vivo experiments we didn't do that because of the lack of time. But we we were we were going to make in vitro first and then in vivo experiments. And the diet compositions were um, the four legume species, lot of tennis. Lotus carniculatus, the hybrid between them and Lucerne. And those species mixed in different proportions with the non legume species that in this case we used Lolium perenne, ryegrass. And those combinations, we have uh, vegetative stages of the lotus and flowering stages. So we have um, multiple model, I mean. We have the combinations of the lotus species, of the legon species, and the inclusion levels and the phenological stages. Okay. Great. And um, we have another question from Tulasi from Nepal, and he has asked if you've been able to see any changes in rumen microbiota yet as an effect of condensed tannins. And um, Alejandro, feel free to also respond. If Regarding microbiology, we we haven't done that yet because we are performing those analyses and we are still analyzing it. So that part of the microbiology, we, we are still doing it. Great. Um, we have a question from Ahmed 
directed to Jacobo um, or any other senior researcher on the call, can we work on extracting condensed tannins and feed to animal as feed additives since it has been proven effective in methane reduction? I would say that is uh, that is worth to try. I think uh, as an additive, if we are able to extract them to quantify, then we will need to find a way how to uh, yeah how how to preserve or how to administrate those uh, compounds in the diet of the animal, especially in confined environments like for cut and carry systems or uh, uh, Feed lots, for example, probably is worth to try. I haven't seen any any anybody trying that, but probably a good idea. Okay, great. Alejandra, would you like to make a comment, or any of the other senior researchers on the call? Um, hello. Hello. Yes, uh, regarding to tannins, uh, I think we can buy commercial products uh, made with a extract of tannins from uh, cheese nut and from and as well from uh, uh, brachiaria. But yeah, uh, I don't know many people using them. And I wanted to make a comment as well about the effect of tannins because in Vanina's uh, experiment, uh, considering that the effect of the tannins, the most relevant effect is uh, modifying the natural metabolism by basically by binding tannin with proteins, we have been as well analyzing uh, the impact of, the, of these tannins in terms of efficiency of natural utilization and increase in uh, microbial protein synthesis. Okay, well, thank you everyone. And thank you, Vani, for those questions. That was really great. And we can continue this discussion at the end with a little more time. Right now, um, we will shift to Penelope. If you're ready to present Penelope, I will open up your slides. Dear participants and supervisors, I am Penelope Miovo, coming from Benin. My host organization is the Beef Cattle Research and Development Center, Department of Livestock Development, Nakon Wachajima Province in Thailand. I am going to present to you my research protocol about life cycle assessment of sedentary cattle farming systems across two ecological zones of Benin. Benin? The livestock production system is currently marked by intensification and the shift toward more sedentarized cattle production systems. Due to recurrent conflicts, a decree was signed in December 2019, adopting a law that prohibits cross-border transhumans in Benin Republic. Therefore, this increases the pressure on livestock herders to practice a more sedentarized cattle farming system. This sedentarization raised several questions. Is sedentary cattle system a solution for better milk and meat yields? How are fed resources valued in the different sedentary cattle farming in Benin? What are the ecological impacts of such a sedentary lifestyle? How can these systems be improved to better meet the meat needs of the people of Benin? To answer these questions, we will evaluate the feed resources use efficiency and manual management of different cattle farming systems within and across ecological zones in Benin. To do so, the quality, amount, and prices of all resources used as inputs and the quantitative transformation as outputs will be recorded. Feed conversion efficiency, dry matter, and nutrient balances will be calculated and computed for each farming system per ecological zone. We will study the effect of grazing behavior of cattle in sedentary cattle farming systems on pasture diversity and the physical chemical properties of rangeland soils across ecological zones in Benin. 
we will use the hand plucking methods for botanical diversity and bio biomass production. We will analyze some pasture samples for quality, um, analyze them for carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, sodium, magnesium, and pH. Ingestion, trampling, soil permeability, and pressure exerted by cattle on soil will be assessed. To assess the environmental impact of the different sedentary cattle farming systems studied across ecological zones in Benin, we will use the life cycle assessment method through the software GLIM. This will allow us to evaluate the emission of methane, carbon dioxide, and nitrous oxides from each stage of production. Finally, to develop scenarios for increased use resource use efficiency so as to decrease GHG emissions in the various sedentary cattle farming systems investigated in Benin. We will use the CLIM interactive model and the data we will put into the model are about the herd feed ration and intake, animal emissions, manure and feed emissions. Two ecological zones in Benin, Sudanian and Guinea Congolian zone, with three locations per zone. Three sedentary cattle farm types will be studied, namely sedentary storine farm, sedentary crossbreed farm, and sedentary zebra farm, as classified by Wisu and all 2019. For expected results. The most efficient cattle farming system in each ecological zone in Benin is known. The actions to be improved for sustainable cattle system management in each ecological zone in Benin are also known. The results will allow us to do some recommendations on the diet and management practices of sedentary cattle farming systems to reduce environmental emissions from cattle farming in the Sudanian and guinea Congolian zones while maintaining or improving the profitability of the systems. Thank you for listening. My name is Fabiano Alecrim. I'm from Brazil. My host institution is National Institution for Agricultural Research in Uruguay. In my PhD title is Nitrous Oxide Emissions in Pasture System and Mitigation Strategies. If cattle is on of the activities that most increase Brazil's gross domestic product, Brazil is the second largest producer of beef in the world and the largest exporter. 90% of beef cattle in Brazil beef cattle in Brazil are raised on pasture. Much of the greenhouse gas emissions in Brazil are associated with this activity, mainly sent from enteric methane and the nitrous oxide from fasces and urine deposit in, on pastures. The screening of animals deposit on pastures has amounts of nitrogen in organic and inorganic form which can generate nit nitrous oxide flows during the process of nitrification and denitrification, depend on, so depend on soil and climate conditions. According to the PCC, 2% of the nitrogen deposited in the soil in this form em emitted in the form of nitrous oxide. However, studies on tropical pastures rev shown that this value is above the real value, which can generate uncertainties in the national inventories. The general objective of this investigation is to quantify nitrous oxide from cattle scratter deposited in the soil in tropical grass pasture system under different forms of nitrogen fertilization, including mixture with legumes. The specific objectives are determine the urinary volume and fecal production of the animals and their concentrations of nitrogen, estimation the nitrogen, nitrogen balance 
in the soil, plants, animal, atmospheric system. Over time, and nitrous oxide emission factors for urine and feces to the soil of cattle feed tropical pastures. Mensur the weight gain productivity and the animal low in this study system. The study will be conducted in the state of Bahia, tropical climate region under, under the Atlantic forest biome. Nitrogen oxide flows will be adopted in the three treatments. Grassland brachiaria fertilized with nitrogen form industrial process. Grassland brachiaria mixed, mixed with legumes and the brachiaria degraded. Urine and feces will be collected from the animals to quantify the nitrogen low in, the, in this form. In addition, the doses of excreta in pasture areas will be disclosed to determine nitrogen oxide flows. In the case of urine, 1.2 liras will be applied in an area of 0.24 square meters, while 1.8 kg of fresh feces will be applying in a circular area of 0.07 square meters. Gas sampling will be done quaternal for 10 consecutive days using stacked stack chambers closing in 4 times, 0, 10, 20 and 30 minutes. After that they must be analyzed by gas chromatography. The increase in nitrogen, nitrogen in pastures may increase productivity per area and decrease emission per kilo of meat produced. However, there may be an increase in absolute emissions requiring mitigation strategies such as the use of biological nitrogen fi fixation. Well, uh, my name is Mbahari from Ethiopia, and my Cliff Grand host organization is Improper Agrobiology Brazil. Well, resource, my title is Resource Based Soil Fertility Management Strategies for Enhancing Agriculture Production and Climate Change Adaptation. Well, um, the general objective of this study was to explore resource-based soil fertility management strategies for enhancing agriculture production and climate change adaptation and specifically to monitor newton balances in smallholder farmers investigate nodulation and nitrogen fixation potential of native legumes at different nnp fertilizer level and their effect on yield and an uptake of subsequent wheat crop and the third one is to explore yield responses to soil nutrient supply and equipped model based fertilizer recommendation. And the last one was model soil organic carbon dynamics under climate and land management scenario. Well, different methods and approaches were also used for undertaking this uh, research. The first one was the monkey nutrient for quality monitoring nutrient for quality improvement which is monk model was used to estimate nutrient balance at farmers field and field experiments consist of four legume and weight as a control to quantify bn of each legume at different nnp rates were used and in the second season all these legume plots were also rotated with weight and in order to, to understand the role of this legume is to subsequent wheat yield and nitrogen uptake. The study was also used the quantitative evaluation of the fertility of tropical soil, which is craft model, to estimate soil nutrient supply, simulate yield, and recommend fertilizer. And the Rossi model also used to understand soil organic carbon dynamics under climate and the land management. Well, uh, the results indicated that the monkey model based the nutrient budgeting of this study 
revealed that nitrogen and potassium are in a declining trend, whereas phosphorus is positive, which indicated that uh, nitrogen and potassium are overexploited in the steady area, whereas positive is still uh, with, post with um, a positive st soil stock. This study showed that the 20 kgn per hectare and 20 kgp per hectare rates have increased the nodulation, the biological nitrogen fixation, and the yield of legumes, whereas the higher, which is 46 kgn per hectare, reduces nodulation and bind and BN potentials. Legumes such as faba bean, field pea, dogo, and lentil also fixed this 69, 23, 32, and 16 kg of N per hectare and accumulated a surplus soil N of 37, 21, 26, and 13 kg per hectare respectively compared to the wheat plot. Generally, fababin has a high potential for nodulation and BNF potential on, in the uh, And this different legume wheat rotations have also increased the subsequent wheat yield and nitrogen uptake. Well, the cost-based balanced NPK fertilizer recommendation has also significantly increased the wheat, barley, and F yield and NPK nutrient uptake. The model validation results of this QEFT model have also showed that there is a good fit between observed and simulated grain yields. Moreover, insignificant difference between observed and simul simulated yields were also recorded, indicating that the model is promising to predict yield. Well, this model is also used to improve fertilizer recommendation to achieve target and this model also helps farmers to adjust their fertilizer application based on the resources they have, based on the crop demand, the crop demand based on the uh, soil nutrient supply, and avoid also excess application of nutrients, and, the red, and of course reduce cost and potential risks to the environment. Uh, well, uh, the model has also some limitations because it doesn't consider the weather and micronutrient into account. Well, the predicted soil organic accumulation in the in the study area also showed that the baseline scenario one and scenario two is decreasing. The higher soil uh, accumulation in scenario two indicated that farmers can reduce impact of climate change. Of course, scenario one is is a business as usual and scenario two is an improved crop residue management and manure management so uh, here in scenario two which is in the in the appropriate or proper management of crop residue and manure uh, has resulted higher accumulation soil organic uh, carbon accumulation but still it is small and will not be possible to improve soil productivity and attain feed security. Therefore, application of inorganic fertilizer is, is mandatory. Therefore, design of feature soil fertility strategies which include use of both organic and inorganic fertilizer together, together with the integrated soil and water conservation uh, practices are very important. Well, as a conclusion, uh, literatures in the highlands of Ethiopia say that soil nutrient is depleting, and this monkey model based on nutrient budgeting of this study also confirmed that the nutrients are declining. Application of starter and fertilizer and P significantly improved BNF, however, nitrogen, higher nitrogen reduced BNF potentials. Legumes mainly fababin fixed higher biological nitrogen fixation and improved and up, uptake of subsequent yield. Improved yield and uptake of subsequent wheat and has economic profitability to low initial investment. Therefore, uh, 
use use of kept model is also essential because it is a dynamic model which adjusts fertilizer rate based on the yield target and farmers resource endowment as as per the nutrient balance and crop response to fertilizer the study areas demand higher in containing fertilizer than uh, phosphorus containing fertilizer because phosphorus, phosphorus is a positive in that nutrient balance the Rossi model based predicted soil organic accumulation for this century showed a decreasing trend this is all about uh, my phd uh, research thank you very much Hello everybody, my name is Israel Oliveira Ramalho, I'm Brazilian and my training will be in Argentina in the city of Buenos Aires. The title of my thesis is Nitro Oxide Emissions from Soil Under Brachiara Pastures Managed with Nitrogen Fertilization or Intercropped with a Forage Legume. In Brazil, about 35% of greenhouse gas emissions came from agriculture and livestock. Of these, 80% are emissions of nitro oxide from bovine excreta on pastures. These data are based on protocols from International Panel on Climate Change, where it is estimated that the nitro oxide emissions from feces and urine in the field is 2%. But many field experiments suggest that this value is overestimated. Well, as you know, beef cattle farms in Brazil are commonly monoculture of tropical forage grass with low nutrient replacement. That's why the use of forage legume in association with the grass is recommended. There are two main benefits of using these combinations. First, it improves the supply and nutrition quality of forage, reducing the fattening time and the greenhouse gas emissions by the cattle. It also saves the necessity of the nitrogen fertilizers because of the association between legumes and N2 fixing bacteria. Therefore, the goals of my work are comparing the productivity and sustainability of the fertilization or with nitrogen fertilizer in brachiary brisanta pastures and the mixed pastures of Eurocluva brisanta with macrotiloma axillary. Additionally, through a meta-analysis, our group aims to compare the emissions factor of studies with experimental data already published with that estimated by the IPCC. For this, we have a field experiment ongoing in Seropédica, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, at my university. Where we will evaluate the productive systems, brachiara monoculture without and with nitrogen fertilization, 150 kg of nitrogen and the brachiara mixed with macrotiloma. We will also measure the weight gain of beef cattle, the forage on offer and intake legume of legume and grass by cattle. Feces and urine after depositions on the soil surface will be evaluate emissions of nitrogen, ni nitro oxide and methane and volatilization of ammonia will quantify biological nitrogen fixations. At the same time, a meta-analysis to estimate the, the emissions factors of feces and urine deposited in the Brazilian fields is in progress. We expect to find difference between greenhouse gas emissions from feces and urine and a small difference between greenhouse gas emissions from excreta from fertilized and mixed treatments because the nitrogen inputs in the system are similar. However, we expected a high emissions from the nitrogen fertilizer treatments than, than from the legume residues. We also assume that the mixed treatments will reduce the fastening time of the animals, which will give lower greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of meat produced. Preliminary meta-analysis data show an uh, emissions factor lower than the one suggested by the IPCC. Using the method of calculating the average by the inverse of variance and graphs of frequency distributions of the average, we arrive at the emissions factor value of 0.25 and 0 for urine and feces respectively. 
the use of forage legumes in incipient in Brazil. We hope to validate a more sustainable livestock production system based on the use of grassland intercropped with legumes and provide a more accurate data for the national inventory of greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks, that is all. Any question?